My name is Joel Garrison. I'm a hypercurious learner and a lover of the sense of sight, like most everyone. I'm delighted to moderate this podcast dedicated to sight on behalf of the Internet of Senses Institute. Today, we're incredibly excited to speak with a highly successful businesswoman who is also a teacher, researcher, educator, and leader. Please welcome Professor Elizabeth Strickler. Elizabeth is best known as an expert and advocate for promoting and utilizing non-fungible tokens or NFTs to build a more robust cultural economy. Her April 2021 TEDx talk is the entry point for those seeking to understand the NFT metaverse space. She spends much time presenting and engaging in conversations about NFTs. Elizabeth is also a very well-established academic. She holds positions in the Business School and the College of Arts and Sciences at Georgia State University, where she is the founding director of the Creative Industries Blockchain Lab and director of media entrepreneurship. She also teaches media innovation and has successfully led multiple efforts to secure grants to research innovation and extended reality or XR in education. When she's not speaking about NFTs or teaching, she helps others start businesses and tell immersive stories. Her eccentric interests are evident in her academic credentials. She holds a Bachelor's of Arts in Philosophy from Boston College and two degrees from Georgia State University. First, a Bachelor's of Science in Computer Science and a Master of Fine Arts in Digital Filmmaking and Art. There is much to appreciate about Elizabeth, her work, and her outlook on life and education. One of my favorite things about Elizabeth is her philosophy of education. She believes most people can learn most things and have fun. I encourage everyone to please check out Elizabeth's full bio, which we will link to our distribution of this recording. Elizabeth, before we discuss NFTs or the academic side of your work, please tell us more about your community service. Oh, my community service. <laughs> um, okay, well, probably my um, biggest effort in that, actually, I've, I've done several things, but um, most recently, I was um, the, on the chair of the board for a high school that I helped start. Um, and so that, you know, just sort of shows my interest in education and new ways to educate. And so that was for the new school, which is um, a, a K, I mean, a, um, ninth through 12th grade high school in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, so that was, that's, was pretty big effort as far as community service goes. But before that, I also did some projects bringing technology and computers to girls in India. Um, I'm a big believer in technology as a pathway to the future. Uh, very nice. I uh, didn't mean to surprise you with the question about your community service. It's just one of the things when I was uh, doing research on, on you that uh, I really, um, really stood out and I really appreciate um, what all you've done. It seems like from those efforts in reading and learning about you, that you're really uh, tied in to the Atlanta community. Uh, Atlanta, I think, has a big place in your heart. But I noticed, as I read in your bio, that uh, you got your undergraduate from Boston College. So I'm wondering, were you raised in Atlanta or uh, came to Atlanta later in life? And, and uh, tell us the backstory, because I'm sure this is a pretty fascinating story. Yeah, I'm not sure if it's super fascinating, but probably, you know, I'm, uh, when I was growing up, I was embarrassed to be from the South and I thought it was backwards. And um, I, so I was striving to get out of the South. So that was, so I was born and raised in Atlanta and even my family, most people in my family were as well. So, uh, and Atlanta was a much smaller town, you know, it was not quite the, uh, you know, metropolitan global city that it is now. So I wanted to go to someplace different. And um, somehow I just researched schools and ended up at Boston College. And it turned out to be fabulous for me. Um, and I used to call Atlanta my nemesis. But 
I ended up moving back and then I ended up um, getting a one-way ticket to Istanbul and never coming back again, but again came back. And now I'm a big lover of Atlanta and find it to be um, a very forward-thinking city. And that that's that's really amazing. And um I'm equally curious, again, as I mentioned, you you got your bachelor's degree in philosophy. I, I did a minor in philosophy. I I love uh philosophy. I for me, uh being raised in a rural area in Arkansas, I, I went to Arkansas State. So it was local, but I was always trying to expand my, you know, go beyond my comfort zone, expand my thinking and challenge myself. So I, I I did the philosophy minor, and I eventually did a master's degree in speech communications and theater. Uh, but I was uh, very short on talent, and uh, never never thought I would go into the theater or uh, be a public speaker. I did that because I was trying to. I, I was so terrible at public speaking when I was when I was younger. I'm still not great at it. But I was doing that to try to address a strength. Now, you went from being a philosophy major to getting a master's degree in computer science and then a, another master's degree in fine arts. Were you always an art lover? How did you come to appreciate art so much? And when did you decide to make it your passion in life? And if I can throw another question in there, why digital art? Yeah, so um, the the main answer to all of that is photography. So when I was young, uh, my father was really into photography, and I got very into photography. So um, so I got my uh, bachelor's degree in philosophy, but I had a minor in film. So um, I so I always was very, and my mom's very artistic and a painter. So you know, I guess my self-expression was through photography. And that is the, the, what I think the link of the technology component to art, you know, and then an art artistic expression. So um, everywhere that I went after college, I would build a dark room. Of course, people don't need to do that nowadays, but in order to develop your own film, you know, you had to have a dark room. So it's very technical, you know, component to um, self-expression. So I think that's where the link to the digital is. But the, but the other thing is that the reason why, so I got the degree, loved art, you know, Boston was incredible to, to experience new music and art particularly. Um, but of course, with the philosophy degree, I did this. This is an odd way of phrasing it, but this is how things were phrased um, in the 80s was that I worked for emotionally disturbed adolescent girls. So I helped like worked at a like school halfway house kind of thing for girls who had been removed from the home because it was too dangerous. They needed to find uh, stability. So, but I did that for a year and that was really hard. So when I moved back to Atlanta, they needed math teachers and I had always loved math. So I was sort of just boning up on my math skills um, at Georgia State when I found computer science. And the logic of that is very philosophical, actually. Um, so so that's where, where that came in. And um, I just loved computer science. So when I was at Georgia State, I became a systems administrator and was helping run all the computers there. And they got a grant from Kodak to do special effects on film. So that at that time, you had to scan the film um, into a computer and then frame by frame do the effect on the, um, you know, digitally. So you've scanned it. So now you've got a digital image of each frame. So then you would do the effects um, on a computer. Um, this was before After Effects or anything like that. And then after you had done the, the effect, so simple things like doing a foreground, you know, combination with a um, background, you know, green screen and removing the green screen, um, that, you know, a composite is, is what that is. So then you would have to print it back to film so that it could play in the theaters. So it's this, this you know, the virtual to the, you know, the real 
to the digitized, back to the real. That's that is sort of what's informed me and you know um, inspired me from the get go. So while you know, and because I got my MFA while I was working as a systems administrator at Georgia State, that you know gives you the terminal degree that allows you to teach in any of the art artistic fields. And so when I started teaching, did I was doing like editing, teaching editing and teaching filmmaking and teaching storytelling, things that I had been learning, sort of this idea of nonlinear was coming up. And, but one of the things I noticed was that students would spend an inordinate amount of time working on a single film, but without really understanding the, it's how it might impact or play with an audience. So that's very much, you know, it was sort of a zeitgeist mindset of design thinking, which is a human-centered design, which is when I create a thing, how will it re resonate with others? And so I started kind of really delving into that. So I was teaching a little bit of design thinking and business skills, basically to creatives, to try to help situate themselves in a place that would help them have more potential success by understanding not like the business of art and film, uh, but the but understanding um, how your work might resonate and who it might resonate with best and how to amplify that. So, wow. So again, that 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 community service aspect comes out again. So. I connect all the dots now. I I understand, you know, your love for Atlanta, your love for art. It, it's uh, all coming together as far as how you've uh, come to where you are in life. So that's that's really really amazing, and that uh, that fits in very well with my next line of questions. Uh, before we we go to NFTs. I want to explore some fundamental aspects of visual art, similar to what you just touched on. I think that idea of how you're connecting students with design thinking to the to the to the viewer, to the audience, uh, to the customer in a business sense, I think all of those things are very important to the the lines of um, you know reasoning that you. Uh, you know, take on NFTs. Uh, so I think that this will tie in the sense of sight as well, uh, which, you know, our, it's what this podcast, it's our central area of exploration. I also think this will help the listener better appreciate uh, your advocacy for NFTs. So these next four are super basic questions. Uh, but again, I think they're essential for, you know, especially non-artists to understand before exploring the future of NFTs. First, a uh, super simple question, uh, what is visual art, uh, especially in the context of the sense of sight? Okay, so you asked what is visual art, not digital yes. art. Yes. Okay. Yes. Visual art. Okay. So before I answer that question, I do want to answer that question, but I do want to tell you the classes that I teach because I think oh, that- I'm sorry. Because, no, no, that's because I think it will um, lead into that, which is, so- so I was teaching in the, you know, mostly in, in film and media and, you know, starting to recognize that that students were working really hard on this, you know, this digital content that was, um, you know, meant to have an audience, but it wasn't really taking the audience into consideration. So it was a lot of self-expression, but not a lot of conversation of the artist to the viewer or the you know, audience. So, so I started teaching business to um, media students and, and subsequently I got um, hired. So now I'm jointly appointed to the business school because I started te teaching creativity to business students. So, so it's interesting that, so that sort of interplay, but what is visual art? So um, I largely teach in the moving image space, which would be more in any kind of film, television, or just moving image that might just be purely artistic, that might not have a, a linear story to it. 
So there's probably so much more to visual art than that, because obviously there's painting and there's all different mediums. I'm, I play in the, the moving um, image, which really requires some form of digitization, unless you use like a paper, you know, um, you know, one of those, I, I can't remember what they're called, but they're, you know, you spin the, you flip the paper, a flip book or something like that. So yeah, I mean, visual art can do some combination of strange uh, pairings or strange connections that help you make a bigger aha to what existence is about or something like that. You know, so, so in that regard, I, I do love the, you know, the, the, the strange, but with, because it's sort of leading you into a new concept or a new way of thinking. And that's the, these new ways of thinking, you know, with um, visual art, um, you know, or art in general is what's so compelling about it. That's why I love art. Yeah. And I've, I've also, I've read that art uh, and, and literature, a lot of times there were, there were a reflection of ideas the cutting edge ideas of the time or the ideas that are shaping the times. Uh, they seem to be a reflection of a lot of our aspirations in, in, in society, a lot of our controversies in society. Uh, so th there's more on the intellectual side, but in the end, it's still the visual uh, res you know, how it resonates with us visually that really uh, sticks with us. And, you know, that's, I, I wanted to make that point today, uh, again, because the podcast is about sight. So we try to explore, you know, the the sense of sight and, and, and how these different topics impact, you know, that. So the next question that I had is actually along this, this line of thinking, you know, what makes visual art impactful. So I, I think I kind of uh, shed some light on that, but uh, do you have any ideas about that? The thing is, is it takes, it, it can happen in a second. You know, you can be impacted within such a small amount of time if we're talking about non-moving or even moving, you know, because um, there's new art forms that are sort of bubbling up. You know, we can get into that a little bit more, you know, with digital art, but, you know, just a quick second and you can have your perspective on life changed just from that that very brief moment yeah so it is curious in when i first crafted my questions a couple of the questions that i crafted were actually about what you just mentioned and i wouldn't hit you with this but the fact that you talked about your dad being a photographer and photography kind of being your your gateway into the digital art uh, and being a lover of art. When I was doing my my research to prep for this, trying to understand digital art, one of the things I read about was when photography came out. A lot of people felt like photography photography was going to either that it wasn't art compared to painting. Or that it was going to, in some way, ruin, you know, painting. And from what I've read, and again, it's just a little bit, it it seems like it had the opposite effect. So I'm wondering if you can kind of maybe talk a little bit about, you know, the, the evolution of art from painting, from visual art, from painting to photography to now digital art, and kind of what your your you know, what, what your thoughts are on that and just kind of, you know, enlighten us about that, uh, that evolution that has occurred. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, um, where I'll speak to that and, and I mean, I think it's super fascinating right now. So obviously, you know, when photography came along, you know, people spent so much time painting and learning, the craft of painting. You know, we get really caught up in these terms of whether something is craft versus art and imagination, right? So craft would be that you can replicate a scene in its most exact, you know, visual form possible. You know, so um, so there's, but but no matter what, it is a perspective that, you know, it's, it's got a personal perspective to it, even if it's 
you know, a scene that you and I are both looking at precisely and your precise replication of it with your, you know, exquisite painting, you know, capabilities would still be different than my, you know, exquisite craft paint, you know, ability. So, so I think though that, that when photography came along, the craft of painting, you know, and the imagination and perspective seemed like it was going to be, you know, destroyed. And what's, you know, what's very interesting to me is not necessarily the transition to, to digital art. Um, well, there, there's two things. The transition to digital art, which is where not only can I take a photograph, but then I can manipulate it in any way that I want or recombine it in any way that I want. So, you know, some people use photography to document the truth. <laughs> Um, and it's more of a, just like some writers write more journalistically to write about something specifically that happened. And then other writers write about like, you know, their wildest imaginations um, and fiction. Same with visual arts. You know, some people document reality to it's, you know, is, is as exacting as they want. And then others are, are being imaginative. Um, the problem with digital art is that then, truth and fiction got all jumbled up and we are we are in the thick of it at the moment and and then so so there's that component of it which is you know fact or fiction um but the other component of that's so interesting about photography is right now as you're seeing so many people be very upset about artificial intelligence and art photography is a great way to kind of learn how new tools do not ruin art. Um, and so uh, so I often use um, photography to kind of talk about this this fear that that art is ruined by these new technologies. and quite often it's not. It just opens it up even more. yeah, I'm and I'm so glad that we actually uh, explored that that evolution because my my fourth, foundational question is actually about the monetary value of art and i think it the history of that which coincides with each of those different i guess we would say disciplines um is also equally rich and leads us to you know the the discussion of uh nfts so even when a painter was first painting art you know hundreds of years ago I mean, they struggled to have intellectual, um, you know, control over that. Although, I guess it was much easier for them. They they would they would a lot of times. I guess they made a lot of their money painting portraits or uh, doing actual work that somebody wanted that they had the skill to do and nobody else could replicate it. But if their art ever became anything that was um, kind of popular, um, you know, sentiment or, or um, popularly known, they had a difficult time being rewarded for that. And I think the same for photography. So if you could talk a little bit about the history of uh, protection of artists as far as their intellectual craft and um, how that's evolved along with art over the years. Yeah, I mean, you know, I don't know the entire history, um, but I, but you know, I can talk about sort of recent history. Is that it's all about labor, and you know, so how much time and energy are you putting into something? But also, people have to make a living, and the you know, we you know, the story of you know, Vincent Van Gogh is a perfect example. You know, lived in poverty, um, not appreciated, painting constantly. You know, you make money when it's work for hire. So that's when you're talking about the, you know, painting portraits or, you know, um, being commissioned for something. So when it's work for hire, um, you get basically you're paid for your time, usually, you know, pretty, pretty specifically your time. Um, and but you don't get the 
ongoing generational wealth or the ongoing, you know, propagated wealth from, you know, if, if, if Vincent Van Gogh were alive and he sold a painting for a hundred dollars to somebody, and then that person went on and sold that, that painting um, for a million dollars to somebody else, Vincent Van Gogh would not have gotten any of that. Although now in Europe, you do get that. That is actually a, a, a royalties are seen in Europe as uh, you know, necessary for artists. And that's, that's really a fantastic implementation of a great, a great law because um, it, for the example that I just gave, so many people uh, don't really gain the rewards for the creative vision and the labor that they did. And, and, you know, so, so that's sort of the, the lay of the land is basically, you know, you can either get paid work for hire, which is just straight, you know, your hourly labor or some form of that. Um, or you can sort of become established as a person who is somehow seen as going to go up in value and be somehow a um, important icon in the, in the human conversation. Yes. You know, and so it's, so it's, um, so it's basically like taking a bet on a stock, right? I, you know, so that's why you think people, you know, uh, museums or galleries look for young, influential, you know, up and coming because it's not necessarily that that art will become more valuable, but that that will become an important conversation in the human evolution. I think that's a great answer. I really appreciate that. My next two questions, I actually am going to give them to you at the same time because I'm not sure uh, which one is better for you to address first. I want to ask a question. I want you to tell us, introduce us to um, NFTs, but I also want, if you will, please um, tell us about how uh, the digital art form is evolving uh, because I know that there's a lot of exciting things happening. I think the two kind of go hand in hand, um, but I'm going to pass it to you and, and let you uh, uh, tell me if I'm right or not. Sure. So, yeah, you know, just um, as far as, so now we get into sort of digital art and, you know, if we're, we go back to the painting, Vincent van Gogh painted, you know, the starry, starry night and there's one copy of it, right? So there's one copy of that and it has immense value because it's in it's in physical form. And, you know, unless somebody makes a, you know, a, sort of a fake copy of that, you know, in physical format, that's the original painting and that's the one that's worth all the money. So if I have it, then you cannot have it. And if you have it, I cannot have it. So that's that's how art and all the laws and rules around art were until the digital format came along. There was there was sort of sort of the next sort of step would be more like photography, which is you know you can have the single you know Ansel Adams photo um, that was the original, but then there could be some um, prints of that photo and then they're they're labeled you know one through ten and there can be these very controlled um replications of the original but they're very well documented and it's in a physical format because if i have ansel adams you know photograph print number three of ten you cannot have that also unless you know so 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 that's like very deterministic um, and so once, you know, digital uh, art came along, digital artists were constantly complaining because they could mostly only get paid work for hire because once their digital, whether it's a moving image or a, or a song, an audio song, or a still digital image that's, you know, super remarkable, once it's out on the internet, right click and done. So it's the right click problem. You know, we we replicate everything. And so that's the world that that many digital artists, especially like people who are doing special effects and film effects and all of that, they were very frustrated because they were able to do some incredible work, but they could only get paid per hour. 
or for hire. And once their, uh, their masterpiece was out on the internet, it might even not even be attributable to them, much less financially valuable to them. So the NFT, which is the non-fungible token, the big trick um, actually came with um, the cryptocurrency Bitcoin. The trick that Bitcoin did was, we'll go back to the to the painting thing. Right now, if I have a dollar and I want to give you a dollar, you know, if it's literally a, 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 the actual dollar, I if if I give you the dollar, then I no longer have the dollar, right? Well, of course, we 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 went into the sort of digital um, uh, transaction. You know, banks sort of became the clearinghouse for those um, transactions. So. When I give you a dollar via PayPal or something, lots of authoritarian, you know, organizations structure it. So when I give you a dollar um, in digital format, I no longer have the dollar and it's documented that you have the dollar. Um, but the, the trick that Bitcoin did was the ability for me to send you a dollar via email or any other format and then there, there's a, a network of consensus that guarantees that I no longer have the dollar and you have the dollar or the Bitcoin. I no longer have the Bitcoin and you have the Bitcoin. It basically, the, you don't really need to get too much into the technology. The real trick was that there's a way to transact so that a digital item of any sort um, can be provable that it is a singular item that um, and you can follow its trading or transaction from one person to person to person. Um, so that's how and, and that's because once money got into the data system, we realized we had to fix that problem. But now you take that same methodology of uh, digitally protecting um, a digital file and whether it's a .mov file or a dot. PDF file or a .jpg file, and you can then protect it with this blockchain technology, which make, means that it can be a singular provable item that can be that that I originated. If it's my you know photo that I originated, it proves that I owned it, and it, all of its transactions. If I sell it to you and then you sell it to someone else, it is trackable, traceable authenticated and non-hackable. And that's the trick of that. Yeah, I mean, I, that, is, that is really amazing. And uh, I can see how that could have application beyond the art world. I, I assume people are looking at that. I think from a scholarship standpoint, you know, people write and they get cited all the time. And I know that there's ways to keep up with how many times uh, an article is cited, um, but I don't know that it's exact like the NFTs would be. So it seems like the NFTs would have some broader application as well. I want to interject this story in, I, I'm sure you're familiar with it. When I was doing the research uh, for today, I, uh, I assume that Almost anybody would would uh, come across this, but I came across the story of, and uh, forgive me if I don't say it correctly, but uh, Beeple mm -hmm. and how the the, uh, the the title of the article that I, that I read, I think it was from uh, New Yorker, and it says how Beeple crashed the art world. And I think one of the things that people probably lack, latch on to what's most bizarre is Beeple selling one of his works for $69 million. And I, if I read the story correctly, uh, NFTs were a big part of Beeple's uh, story. Um, I assume you're familiar with this. Could you, uh, you know, tell the audience a little bit more about this and, and forgive me if you're, you're not familiar with the story, but I, I just assume that you are. Yeah, no, I'm super familiar with the story. And, you know, what's, so Beeple is a perfect example of why the NFT is so important because he was, um, a, you know, an artist, a digital artist who was doing 
um, work that was amazing people. And it was mostly work for hire. He would do special effects on film. He would do, you know, create amazing magazine covers, you know, mixing um, 3D visuals with um, 2D visuals and, you know, mixing pictures of, you know, famous people, you know, combined and lots, he does lots of stuff with like um, Disney characters and, you know, it's definitely seen as avant-garde and, um, uh, you know, uh, recombining very strange things. An important thing about him before I get into the $69 million is that a lot of his work is meme, you know, meme oriented, um, you know, so the meme is sort of the cultural gene kind of um, idea. But that kind of art, while it might be not be seen as fine art to some people, it is the art of the times and it reflects on what is happening in our culture. So he did a lot of meme work. But so when that uh, Christie's did the auction for his um, art piece, the art piece was called the first 5,000. So an important thing to note about Beeple and that piece of art was that was the first uh, the first 5,000 days of him creating a piece of art every single day. And I, yeah, so I love that because to me, artists don't, um, the artists think that they either have a muse that inspires them or else they're uninspired and don't create great things. Well, actually, art takes practice. And a person who creates artwork for 5,000 days in a row and um, so, so, so basically, the piece of art that was bought by uh, Meta Coven and Tubador, those were um, sort of these, um, you know, pseudonymous names that that purchased um, this uh, artwork. Um, when when you break it down to a person who's really the most influential artist of our time right now, or one of the most influential. And I did, a, at one point in time, I broke down the numbers of 5,000 pieces of artwork into $69 million. And I think it ended up that each piece of artwork was worth about $150,000 each. That's really not, that's not that much, honestly, uh, you know? So, so, but it was a really big deal because that happened early in 2021, right when the NFTs were exploding and Christie's, um, auction house, you know, auctioned it. And these guys, um, Tubador and Medicoven, who've now been doxxed, but at that point in time, they were pseudonymous and, and they bought this work and, and they were collectors of as much digital art and NFT artwork as they could find because they saw the, you know, value of it. So. Yeah, that's, that's such an amazing story. What I also learned about people that, uh, I think is important to um, your discipline of digital art was, you know, people, if I, if I get the story right, you know, come from a really good art family and people himself was a really talented artist who chose to go into the digital art space because I, 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 I read in that it gave him more, um, it, it helped foster his creativity to a higher level. So I, I think that's a really important part of the, the digital art uh, story at this point. Yeah, I mean, the tools that, that you have access to, I mean, you know, go back to just painting. I mean, painting, you can change the brush, you can change the paints, and you can change the surface, you know. I mean, of course, there's people continue to do amazing things, you know, because you can use, you can put paper on there and you can make it 3D, you know, and you can do, you know, you can do the splatter painting, you can do all kinds of stuff, but, but the, you know, access to the tools in the digital world are just infinite and become and have become are getting even more infinite at this point in time. So, so yeah, I think that that story, I'm, I really appreciate the fact that the first you know, really expensive NFT did go to a true artist, you know, in the sense that uh, a person who spent a lot of time on the art and craft of what he was doing and not just somebody, you know, again, if you wouldn't go back to photography, a person who just snaps a quick snapshot is very different than an Ansel Adams who spends days waiting for the right sunlight and the right, 
you know, snow formations and, you know, sits out in the cold for a week before yeah. the the photo is perfect. Yeah. I mean, so wrapping up now and thinking about people and how you laid out and, and taught us so much about NFTs, what do you see is the future? Where are we going with uh, NFTs and uh, where is the digital Where's the digital art form? Where, where do you think it's headed? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, I mean, it's so complicated now. And, and you know, NFTs really got a bad rap and, and, and rightfully so, because there was a lot of speculation, a lot of, you know, just trying to like make money. And so I think we're going to go into NFT 2.0. And, and one thing that I want the audience to know is that word is so complicated and nobody likes that word. So you really, we can call it a digital asset, you know, or just digital art that has, you know, a trackable, you know, protection around it. And so, so what I say is like, it's, it's just a digital asset. So when you think of cryptocurrency, just think of digital money. And when you think of an NFT, just think of a, a digital artwork or digital asset that's got, you know, protection on it. But it's, I, I think that we're going to see some larger artists, perfect example, at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, um, Rafiq Anandal um, is creating, he's got an AI generated art, the AI is, is trained on all of the art in the museum, so it's not stealing from anywhere that was not, you know, planned or okay, but when you go there, you get an NFT of that artwork and it's really more of a proof of um attendance so a lot of times so you get a proof of attendance that you know on january 1st of 2023 you went and went to the museum and you saw that piece of artwork um so i think we're going to start to see these very unique uses the, the the other thing that i haven't really talked about is that the the nft or you know the code around the the uh, digital artwork can have programming of all sorts, like this can't ever be resold. Or when this gets resold, you know, the original owner gets 10%. That's sort of the generational wealth kind of thing, ad infinitum. Or that this piece of art, you know, can't be sold more than a certain number of times or whatever it might be. Or or that you could even make it where it's geolocated and it can only be sold when it's in this part of the world or this city or something like that. So that art form of being able to have this programmatic component is super fascinating. Um, new kinds of art forms like, you know, maybe you buy a particular NFT and I buy a particular NFT and we decide to combine them and somehow do a collaboration. So you, we're seeing that where people... Um, by different parts of an NFT and then they merge them together. So it's, this, it's like a collaborative game. There's so many new art forms that are coming up that are just sort of mind bending in a, in a way. So I think we're going into a next stage, but, but the artificial intelligence that can pump out amazing art quite quickly has got me a little um, confused. And I think we're going to start to, but, but again, I feel that it is similar to the, you know, photography. It's a new tool. We're, we're going to see where, what people create. And, you know, the real question is like, where do you draw the line between something that I just spit out very quickly that doesn't, that doesn't need an NFT and doesn't need to be protected, you know, from cop being copied and that needs to be monetized versus something that I've spent some real time and energy on and I need to protect that. Yeah, so lots lots to sort out. I know that you're also an expert on the metaverse and uh, extended reality, virtual reality, augmented reality. It, it just seems like there's so many things right now that are kind of on the table. It, it's, really, it, it's really bizarre trying to figure out where it could all go it, it really is um a pretty wide open space right now as far as creativity and what comes next yeah i mean you know because i i deal in virtual worlds a lot and i start to see that world building and building new worlds is one of the art forms that we're going to really see explode which is 
um, you know, 3D virtual worlds that, you know, you create a whole world that's, that is not just the painting, but walking into the painting. And then that things can happen in that space. So I think we're, we're, I mean, we're seeing that happen now and that's really exciting. And I think I've heard you in a, in a previous presentation, talk about the NFTs and how we're doing it right now. Like you can have in you know, something like Second Life or or some type of uh, emerging extended reality, you can buy fashion and you it's not just art. It's it's a way to protect uh, creativity. And I, I like what you said. It's, uh, you know, at what level is creativity kind of happenstance and too common to really be merchant, you know, marketable or um, monetized? And at what level... Do we say that, yeah, that's something really special and there's training and things that went into that and we need to protect that? Yeah, you know, it's it's very interesting because the the old the younger you are, the more your life is spent, you know, in, in digital worlds. And and I'm not an advocate that we all spend time only in digital worlds, but we spend half of our time in digital worlds. And I think we probably will continue. So the younger you are, if you play video games and you have an avatar, I mean, you know, you woke up and put on those glasses that you have, you put on your shirt that you have, you put, you bought that painting that you have. So, so all the kids in the virtual worlds, they're doing that constantly. And that stuff has meaning to them and took time and, and it cost Robux or, you know, um, some, so they've spent time working on their avatars and working on their clothing, and they're going to continue to want to buy digital assets for that world. And that's, uh, you know, it doesn't make sense. The older a person is or the less person spent in, in those worlds doesn't make sense, but you talk to kids and it makes a lot of sense to them. Absolutely. Well, as we, uh, wrap up is there anything that i didn't i didn't mention or anything else that you'd like to uh to say to to uh, put a bow on uh the discussion today well yeah i guess there's one thing that i just think is it's very interesting um because we're talking about sight and i just want to kind of throw this bizarre sight idea um in and you can keep this um or or let it go but we are training like self-driving cars. They're typically trained in a virtual world first. So they're put in a virtual simulation that looks like a city and they're trained to, um, you know, stay on the right side of the yellow line and stop when they see the red light. And then, uh, and then only after it's done that training, does it go into the real world? And then we're doing the same with um, robots do that, but humans can do that too. So these virtual worlds can be places where you get trained um, and you can train and practice and experiment with life in certain ways before you go to the real world that has a, a bigger impact. Anyway, I just think that's an, an interesting um, site concept. Oh, it's very interesting. I really appreciate you, you sharing. Um, Professor Elizabeth uh, Strickler, it's been my pleasure to chat with you today. Your passion for art, for NFTs, uh, your love for the city of Atlanta, uh, for Georgia State University, and also community service is uh, admirable. And uh, Atlanta and Georgia State University are very lucky uh, to, to have you. I really enjoyed talking with you today and your answers were amazing. And I, I hope that the viewers and listeners to this podcast really appreciate your words of wisdom as much as I, I, I have. So thank you. And I really appreciate your time today. Thank you, Joel. I really, um, you, I can see that you were a philosophy major. I really like the depth at which you're thinking about sight and, you know, you've given me some new ideas and things to think about as well. So uh, I really appreciate it and I'm happy to talk about this stuff anytime. I'm I'm insanely passionate about all this stuff. <laughs> yes, you are. And the world, the world, uh, the world needs that. So again, uh, appreciate it. Mm -hmm.